I'm Jesse. I'm here to talk to you today about PhoneGap. Uh, you're all developers here, so we're not going to do any of the reasons why, why we need PhoneGap or any of that sort of stuff. We're going to dive into some more of the, the technical aspects of the, the platform in general. So I'm here, and Shaz is here with me. Shaz is going to do some demos towards the end. Uh, go Canucks. I don't know if there's any Canucks fans out there. There's one at the back. Uh, on Twitter, I'm Purple Cabbage. Uh, Shazron is Shazron. Lucky guy. So here's a, uh, a complicated, simple diagram that explains what PhoneGap is. Essentially, your JavaScript, CSS, and HTML is packaged by PhoneGap into a Chromeless browser on whatever device you're developing for. And then it's deployed to the, mo the mobile device. Uh, in this case, we want to illustrate as well that the mobile device could actually be a car or a TV or a desktop computer. These are all things that are sort of on, on our radar for the future. So PhoneGap may be you know, sort of a misleading name given what we expect for the future. So the, uh, the mobile landscape is constantly changing. These are some numbers apparently from November of last year. Uh, Apple is saying that they're a little bit bigger than that. But you can expect this to all change quite rapidly. Who knows what's going to happen with Windows 8 coming up. It's really hard to pick a winner at this point. Uh, Android has made leaps and bounds. iOS is constantly doing amazing things. RIM is, is sort of uh, going up and down with their, their BlackBerry. and so. It's hard to really say what the future holds as far as mobile. Uh, the big discussion, <laughs> I, I like to be topical. So that doesn't really make sense with native versus web, but at least it was news yesterday. So uh, a big discussion that we always have is, do you develop native apps or do you develop web apps? And we sort of think that they're the same thing, because the browser is native. It's, it's native on every single platform that it runs on. So this allows you to write your application using web technology to run in that browser. Uh, people complain about browsers not being able to do certain things. It doesn't necessarily mean that they can. It just means that we haven't gotten to it yet. So here's an example of an application that was written with PhoneGap that's running on, on four different devices there. There's a, an admin portal behind where uh, ship tracking information is, is entered. And that information is then displayed across all of these different devices. I should point out that this wasn't actually uh, an easy thing to do with the different screen sizes and resolutions and capabilities of these devices. But it is possible, and you can expect at least 80% of your code is going to be reused across these devices. So we have some big uh, contributors involved with PhoneGap. Because we're completely open source, we're MIT licensed, uh, we've had some, some really big parties step up and start committing code. IBM, for example, has four full-time employees dedicated to, to working on PhoneGap and committing code almost daily. Uh, there's also some big parties talking about PhoneGap. Palm has done some really, some really nice uh, tutorials on how to use PhoneGap with WebOS. So it's good to see that. Uh, some big parties that are using PhoneGap. If you're not sure if PhoneGap is right for you, you can ask Alcatel. Uh, this is the, the list of platforms that we currently support. iOS is certainly our, our biggest. Android is a, a close second. And there's uh, there's some contention over, over third place, and it's, it's all that changing landscape. So it's really hard to, to know what's going to be the, the next big thing. But if you're using PhoneGap, you're protected because your code is still going to run. Uh, we've recently deprecated Windows Mobile. Uh, we had to stop working on BlackBerry 4.2 because our developer was going to leave. It was, it was that bad to develop for. So there's also some some prototype platforms, some things that we're working on. Uh, Windows Phone 7, now that we finally have our hands on Mango, 
is probably going to be the, the next one to come along. Uh, the browser, uh, IE9, on the phone is supposed to be a lot better, so we haven't really dug into it completely, but we'll, we'll be the first to tell you when it happens. So being open source, we do everything in the open. So here's some links if you want to uh, keep track of what's going on. Uh, we do our, our planning in, in the open on, on wiki.phonegap.com. You can see what we, what we foresee the, the near future and the distant future to be there. Uh, And our mailing list is extremely active, and it's a very helpful community as well. So I'm going to talk to you about, a bit about what the PhoneGap technique is. So this is, this is the part that's developed in native code that's virtually the same overall technique on each individual uh, device. So all, all of these devices have some sort of browser component. So we instantiate a Chromeless version of that browser. Then we implement some sort of JavaScript bridge code, a way to transfer data from JavaScript to the native side. And we implement a way for the native side to push data back into the JavaScript side. So by doing this in, the, in keeping the, the exact same protocol across all the different devices, you can experience reuse of your code in the, the JavaScript side. So here's a, an exa example PhoneGap exec call from JavaScript. This is calling into native code. So there's a success callback or a, a fail callback. There's a service. This could be something like accelerometer. There's an action. This could be something like get current acceleration. And there's arguments, which could be something uh, that needs to be passed to that particular command. So the way that the iOS PhoneGap exec works is the same as the earlier slide. Uh, we create a, a UI web view. This is how native code can call JavaScript directly. They like their, uh, their extremely long method names. This is Objective C, string by evaluating JavaScript from string. So this is a call from JavaScript to native. Uh, what we do is essentially is we create a URL that contains the service, it contains a callback ID, and it contains some arguments. And the arguments are the command that we're actually calling, the, the method on that, and any, any other arguments that we need to pass along. That's all then URI encoded and stringified with JSON and pass through. And document.location equals URL. So the native side can catch that and realize that it's a command because it starts with the, the gap protocol. And then we can tell the browser not to try and navigate to that page and just pull out that data. Document.location. I shit you not. I should mention that these are partially Brian LaRue's slides, so that's a little bit of his attitude in there. And it didn't seem right to take it out, but I'll, I'll try to say it with the same enthusiasm that he says it with. So in the Android world, it's almost the same, except for it's the complete opposite. So it's also, it, it's been more of a, a winding road because of the fact that Android seems to change a lot of things in every version of their, their SDK. So you can get an, uh, access to a, a browser instance by just importing WebKit. They have this really nice uh, way of, of uh, binding between native and JavaScript. Just add JavaScript interface. So that's a little bit better than the, the document.location stuff that we had to do in uh, iOS. But unfortunately, somewhere along the way, Android 2.3, all of a sudden, emulators, uh, emulators weren't passing this information correctly, and there was all kinds of errors. Possibly it was happening on some devices, too. So being clever, working around, 
uh, Dave Johnson from Natobi realized that cookies were actually shared between JavaScript and native and could be read by both sides. So the way that Android JavaScript communicated to native in 4.2 is by overriding prompt. So cookies was the way that it was until 2.3 came along. And then we had to find another way to do it. And the way that we actually came across that was uh, by overriding the call to prompt from JavaScript. So whenever the prompt was sent from JavaScript, native could intercept that. So that was the override that we did. Overriding prompt, I shit you not. So calling uh, JavaScript from native, uh, we originally did load URL, which essentially just changes the location of the web view to JavaScript colon slash slash and then some arguments so that we're actually calling a function within JavaScript. But one thing that we noticed was happening, it took a, a long time before it actually turned up, but if the user was interacting with the keyboard at that moment that we made a call into JavaScript, all of a sudden the keyboard would disappear and the text field would lose focus. So surprisingly, it took like a year before anyone pointed it out or anyone noticed it. Coincidence, I hope. Uh, so what we ended up having to do is implement a, a small callback server. So essentially, uh, what's happening is in the callback server, uh, we're polling and, and using XHR to pull data from the callback server. So we learned a lot along the way uh, with Android. Uh, and you should never underestimate the ability of developers to uh, put their head down and just get it done. BlackBerry, uh, with the web view, they, they have a nice fully qualified namespace that they, they chose to use, net.rim.device.api.browser.field2, for some reason, <laughs> .browser field. That's OK. <laughs> we can live with that. BlackBerry JavaScript to native. So from BlackBerry, you can call script engine.add extension, phonegap.plugin manager. And this is essentially binding JavaScript to uh, the native side. So plugin manager will get methods called directly from JavaScript. To call from BlackBerry native to JavaScript, we just call execute script, and it runs our JavaScript. So Symbian uses a bridge. Uh, some, some of these, these platforms are getting more lightweight. They're getting more used to the idea of, of things being web pages. So uh, really, a, a lot of the Symbian stuff is already in JavaScript. So really, we're just making a, a small shim to call the functionality that's already there in the browser. WebOS is the, the same thing. WebOS, everything that you write for a typical uh, Mojo, Mojo2 application, and uh, Enyo as well is going to be in JavaScript already. So there's really not a lot to do except for manage the protocol and make sure that it's consistent with the other devices. Interestingly, uh, Node.js is available on WebOS 2, which is pretty cool, I think. So other places that we plan on, on getting uh, PhoneGap running, uh, Bata is actually already working uh, using the, the same sort of iOS uh, document.location changes. Uh, Qt is, is coming very quick. Uh, get, it actually does the same sort of thing. It's going to be a very lightweight shim. Uh, Windows Phone 7 uh, has the ability to, to bind C Sharp directly to uh, the browser component. So these won't be difficult problems to solve. So first of all, we're dealing with all these different devices. There's, there's also another area of complexity that we're finding ourselves having to deal with. And that's all these, uh, all these different groups coming up with what they 
think is the perfect API for calling device functionality. So this is another area where PhoneGap is going to help you because you're going to be calling a consistent API across multiple devices, and it's going to be very standardized, and we're, we're keeping all of these different device APIs in mind so that we're future-proof is our hope. So device APIs define sensors and data. So sensors are, are things like GPS or camera, data, contacts, media. So the, the API designs are a little bit all over the place. Uh, the standards are changing almost continuously. And we're, we're working to, to help because in a lot of ways, the best standard is working code. So a lot of times when, when we feel that the standard has changed in a significant way, really all we're doing is changing our interface a little bit to match the standard. So there's also browser APIs. So uh, this was actually built into the browser as of uh, iOS 3.0. And interestingly, we had already implemented navigator.geolocation.getCurrentPosition with the same arguments before because we had followed the standard. So we were essentially able to just pull out our code and let iOS do its thing because they followed the standard and so did we. Interestingly though, there was a bit of an issue because they weren't uh, expecting UI WebView to be doing this sort of functionality and, and they weren't really aware of PhoneGap. So if there's a prompt in an iOS PhoneGap application that calls get current position, it says, would you like var x39852836 slash index.html to know your location? So they're actually looking at the, the full device path to the page and using that. So we actually ended up having to, to put our API back in and and duck punch theirs to use ours. So here's another example of someone defining a standard. So we saw here we're using navigator.geolocation. Here we've decided, oh, well, let's, let's throw this functionality on window. So here we have window.onDeviceMotion. Mo so this is, this is code that you would write. And behind the scenes, your code would be called when that when that event happened or that property changed. So it's a little, a little bit different way of defining uh, similar functionality. We, uh, I think we prefer the navigator dot uh, way of, of attaching our code. Instead of, uh, this is sort of by convention, you must supply an on-device motion method on your window in order to get that. So there, there's lots of standards uh, committees. We're watching the, the WAC. Uh, this is the way that, that they think it should be defined. So deviceapis.accelerometer.getCurrentAcceleration. So a little bit different there. There's also browser media APIs, which are sort of all over the place. Uh, audio and video, are it's really hard to find uh, any consistency between the different platforms. HTML5 is definitely the standard that we'll all be using going forward. So even if a browser doesn't provide HTML5 functionality in a lot of ways, PhoneGap is providing it to them through our APIs. So here's a, a sample from the, the DAP media capture. Uh, this is this is uh, the HTML5 way of, of doing uh, things like capturing images, movies, uh, audio from the microphone, static images. And soon you'll be able to use all this just by defining your, your correct tags, and it'll all be bound to the JavaScript for you. Here's the, the DAP way of... Uh, accessing a, a sensor, in this case it's the battery and, and watching power or the network. So here's a list of, of APIs that are defined by the DAP. There's a list of APIs defined by WAC. 
And there's also the, the WebIsh SDKs for Symbian, WebOS, Samsung, Bara. So everyone is doing things differently, but their target is ultimately JavaScript. So that's good for us. There is the current PhoneGap API, and those are all the things that you can access across all of the devices consistently. One thing that we learned from all the, all the different standards that we tried to pull together and all the different devices that we tried to pull together is that our individual pieces of functionality need to be very pluggable and, and standalone. So one thing that we're working on is making sure that every single uh, piece of functionality, for example, accelerometer, is implemented as a plugin. So right now we have some JavaScript that changes per device that's actually implementing the accelerometer API. And then native side, of course, is going to vary on every single device. So what we're aiming to do is actually have the accelerometer JavaScript be the exact same piece of JavaScript that runs on all the different devices. And the only thing that changes is what happens after phonegap.exec. So this will allow us to consider everything to be an individual plugin, and it'll run by itself. And this way, we can pick and choose what functionality we want in our applications instead of right now, even if you're not using Accelerometer, you're getting the Accelerometer code, and there's no real way for us to prune that code out. So that's, that's the reason for wanting everything to be a single standardized plugin. And this will also open up the door for build tools and plugin discovery so people can contribute plugins and we can, we can build them automatically because we know that they follow a certain format. So this is a, a plugin interface uh, in Java code. So uh, on the native side, we have what we call a plugin result, and this is how we're going to pass data back in. We have some properties on the plugin, whether it's synchronous or not. Uh, this is really only available on, on Android. Uh, most of the other platforms can't perform any sort of synchronous calls. So that's probably something that's not going to live there. We're probably all going to live with the asynchronous way of doing things, which is probably a better way because we remain responsive the entire time as well. So there's some, uh, some life cycle events there, the on pause, on resume, and on destroy are all things like the, your, your application being switched away from or returned to or completely shut down. So these are all things that we need to be aware of on, in the plugin and on the, the JavaScript application side. And then, of course, there's the uh, activity result. So this is what's going to actually be passed back into uh, some sort of functionality. It's going to actually do the work of the plugin. So this is the, uh, the JavaScript interface. So this is a, a definition notification. So notification.confirm is going to take uh, a message, a result callback, uh, a title, and button labels. And it's going to call PhoneGap exec with the arguments uh, the way that they need to be. And this, this type of, of PhoneGap exec is going to be co completely consistent across all the different uh, pieces of JavaScript, like notification.js. So some, some things that we still need to do, we need to work out how we're going to discover new plugins. Uh, we're working on a way of, of packaging uh, the plugins and easily installing plugins. So something like the way, the way Node Package Manager works or something along those lines where as long as everyone's following a consistent standard, it'll all work. Identity and trust is a little bit harder to, to work out, uh, but we've got our eye on that and, and we're, we're working on it. So we consider when we, when we get plugins resolved, that's when we will be at our 1.0. So we're currently at version 0.9.5.1. So we've sort of been creeping closer and closer to one. But 
these are the things that we really want to have before we can actually say 1.0. And realistically, 1.0 is, is more of a marketing thing than anything else. We could have said that we were at 1.0 a long time ago. We could say we're at version 9.5. To, to us developers, that's actually how it feels. But anyway, the way that we foresee the, the plugins to, to live in the world is there's what's called core plugins, which are things like accelerometer, uh, things that are used across all the devices and sort of functionality that you can't live without. And everything that is already in the, the PhoneGap API is considered a core plugin. Then we, we foresee the, the more plugins, which are partner plugins. So things like uh, PayPal, so if we, if we do a, a partnership plugin, so it would be endorsed by both parties and that would you know, establish some sort of trust uh, over who committed the code. And you could, you could use that without worrying about things. Then there would also be the whole community uh, doing whatever they want, uh, managing plugins in their own repos. And you would, you would be on your own there as far as trust. So, what we've learned is that all of these devices tend to have a browser. Uh, they all have an SDK of some sort, and they expose some bit of native functionality. All browsers have locations. So the easiest way to actually pass data from JavaScript to native is through that location. So any device, you can potentially create that bridge. So developing for mobile web, I'm just going to brush over a little bit about it, but uh, one thing that people ask us a lot about PhoneGap is what do I use for my UI? Uh, do you have a UI framework or any of these sorts of things? We actually leave that completely open. We haven't gotten into the DOM at all, but we do, we can make recommendations uh, and also our, our mailing list is, you know, You'll find people who are using jQuery Mobile or Sencha or uh, JQ Touch, and uh, experts are evolving all over the place. So the mailing list is a great way to get information on that. Uh, so I don't really have to tell you how to write a button. Uh, since most of these browsers are using WebKit, you'll find that the, the CSS3 is pretty good, so you can do all your gradients in rounded corners but you will still have to do that yourself or use a, a DOM framework for UI. Uh, JavaScript, as we all know, the language of the web. Uh, there are some quirks. WTFJS is a site started by Brian LaRue, of course. So, and he, he documents things in JavaScript that don't work the way that you might expect that they would. Um, Configurations, this is something that we're moving towards for uh, each PhoneGap application. This is, this is our way of defining what functionality you access on the device, what, uh, what metadata goes along with, with your application. So this, this is uh, another part of our 1.0. This is how you will specify that you want to use the accelerometer, but you don't want to use the compass. And packaging will help along that way too. So specify your, your splash screen, uh, what your icon is, all, all of these sort, sorts of things so that different tools can build your application and it all works consistently. So tooling. Uh, everyone who works on PhoneGap sort of has their own preference. We don't push you down any sort of uh, path like sort of the way AppCelerator recommends that you use their app Tana. Uh, they don't actually force you, but that's, that's the way that they recommend. Uh, at Natobi, we, between the 16 of us, we can't agree on how we all work, so we don't really expect everyone else to, to jump on whatever we say. So we're completely wide open as far as like uh, IDEs. 
essentially, it's all JavaScript, so it works with all, all of the tools that are out there. So you can compress your code with whatever you want. You can use whichever IDE you want. There's TextMate bundles for PhoneGap. There's uh, Eclipse plugins for PhoneGap. Dreamweaver, actually, uh, in CS 5.5, they, they've made it really easy to develop with PhoneGap. You can do it right from their, their uh, IDE, and you can see a, a live preview of what your UI is going to look like, and press the build button, and it spits out your app running in the, the emulator. So speaking of emulators, uh, there's lots of them. There's one for every device. iOS simulator is probably the best. It's the fastest, certainly. Uh, there's also Ripple, which is a, a browser-based way of, uh, of running your, your PhoneGap application. Uh, I believe that's simply for Chrome. That's a, a plugin. Uh, there's also WebKit Nightly, so you can build your own emulator. Uh, as far as debugging, this is the, the part that Shaz is going to be touching on soon. Uh, you can, you can console.log across any browser. You can, you can run most of your code directly in a browser, uh, assuming that you, you, don't, you, you focus on your UI and you uh, do some sort of proxy to your actual phone gap calls so they're not changing location all the time. So you can, you can rewrite phone gap exec. It's your one point where you would have to return some data and then you can run everything else in the browser and, and test there. Uh, and then there's Winery. And I pointed out that it's not New York City's Winery, Wiener. Uh, it's actually Web Inspector Remote. We call it Wiener. It's kind of an un unfortunate abbreviation, or it was intentional. But uh, this, this was put together by one of the IBM guys. And Shaz is going to do a demo of it, but it allows you to inspect your code while it's running on a, a device or in the emulator. So that's pretty cool. Uh, as far as what libraries to use, uh, there's lots of, lots of DOM libraries out there. You can use any one of these. XUI is uh, an Adobe creation. Uh, Zepto is a, a mobile uh, work-alike for jQuery. Everyone knows what jQuery is. Enyo, there's, there's talk that it may be open sourced at some point, so you can, you can use it for more than just WebOS. Uh, Enyo is a very rich UI framework. Testing libraries, you can use whatever you want. Dominator.js and Thumbs.js are Michael Brooks from Natobi. Uh, Thumbs.js allows you to simulate touch events with a mouse. So that's one thing if you're using touch start and touch end. You, you have to think about these things when you're in, in a desktop browser. Uh, as far as getting some UI elements and getting something up fast, jQuery mobile has is, is come a long way. Uh, Sencha Touch is probably the richest that's out there. There's also uh, Dojo Mobile and Joe are great frameworks. Uh, if you need to store data between runs of your application, you can use LaunchAir, which is Brian LaRue, uh, or Persist.js. Uh, some other concerns that we've had along the way. Uh, it hasn't been easy always. Uh, there's still some problems that we're working on. Uh, one of the biggest is the, the tool chain itself. So if you're if you're developing for all the different devices out there, this essentially means that you have to install six gigs worth of SDKs and tools, and you have to do it on two separate operating systems. So this is, this is sort of a problem. So what we decided to do was we put PhoneGap in the cloud because we love buzzwords. So Shaz is going to be up next. He's going to come and and demonstrate how you can use build.phonegap.com to build your apps. So essentially, you upload your code, and it gives you apps, just like the, uh, the graphic there. Thank you.